So please put your hands together, or as they say in French, <clears throat> how do they say it in French? Uh, merci d'applaudir la honnisserie. All right. How was that French? Merci d'applaudir. Perfect. Was that okay? It's perfect. You're a Frenchman, right? Mm -hmm. Was it's that okay? Fine. It's okay? Uh, yeah. Excellent. So, the people here are curious what is going to happen over the next 10, 15 minutes as we get things going. You mean, beside me trying for the first time this Bavarian outfit? Looks good. Yeah, okay. So, uh, we'll speak about the rise of neobanks in Europe, uh, which is not so new now in 2018, because yeah. we see real unicorns, real activity. So we have the great chance to welcome on stage two co-founders of, I think, the biggest neobank we have right now in Europe. So one being from here, from Germany, so N26. Who doesn't know N26? I don't know here. And uh, one doesn't know, so you will know soon. <laughs> and, uh, and the other one being uh, Monzo. So co-founder of Monzo, which is, by, who is, by the way, also a German guy. So uh, two German, one French, everybody in Bavarian outfit. It will be a nice time about... Uh, the new banks in Europe. Excellent. Well, let's put our hands together for Laurent and his two guests. So please, Maximilian and uh, Jonas, join me. Enjoy. So I welcome uh, Maximilian, co-founder of N26, and uh, Jonas, co-founder of uh, uh, Mondo. Monzo, sorry, <laughs> I still remember the old name, you know. Uh, please introduce yourself, perhaps just in one minute, because. Uh, Never know, in case one or two don't know who you are and what is your company. Uh, sure, so uh, I can go first. I'm Jonas, I'm one of the founders of Monzo. Uh, raise your hand if you know what Monzo is already. Raise your hand if you know what N26 is. Okay. Okay. So, you so are for this playing, audience. You are not playing at home, my friend. I would never ask that one, never uh, <laughs> In this audience. Monzo is, is, a, uh, is a mobile first uh, retail bank in the UK. Uh, very similar to N26 in, um, in design and in stage, so we're at about a million customers now and just looking to expand internationally. Um, I'm origi originally actually from, uh, from Germany and uh, studied in Munich, so it's really, really awesome to be back here. Uh, it's really cool that there's such a big tech event now here, which 10 years ago I think would have been a lot smaller. Thank you. Cool. Uh, my name is Maximilian. I'm uh, one of the founders of uh, N26. N26 is a classical venture-funded fintech startup based in uh, Berlin. Classical fintech startup, uh, with one exception, we got our own banking license, which is still quite rare in the space. Today, we are active in 17 countries. We have the vision to build the first global bank in an extremely fragmented banking market. So you have traditionally French banks for French customers, Italian banks for Italian customers, and so on. And N26 will be the only one, the first one, that based on one IT platform and one banking license uh, is uh, like uh, operating all across Europe and we will go beyond Europe in the next years to come. I'll come back soon on the international <laughs> strategy of both of you. Um, so we have two challenger banks and a challenger of challenger being in Munich today. So um, first question, what's your two different vision on product side? I mean. I don't know, bef before you arrive on the market, nobody was picking the morning about its bank or how cool is its bank app or whatever. People speak about that. Now, your customer at least, and you have quite more than one million each. So could you both of you give us uh, um, your opinion, what is your vision of banking, what should be a banking app uh, today, and what you manage to do with your app and yours? Yeah, um, so I guess, I guess the problem we're trying to address is that <coughs> people are often anxious about money. It is like one of these key sources of anxiety. And we, um, we recently, uh, we recently uh, decided that our long-term vision will be to make money work for absolutely everybody. And you know, towards your question, in the 21st century, I think that means if I am worried about my rate of spending in a month, I should be able to take out an app and just look at it. Or ideally, I don't even have to do that, and it just tells me proactively when that is so. Or perhaps there are things that are really difficult to understand, like I have a emergency purchase I need to make, my car breaks down, but I don't really understand how loans work or how to get a loan, and all those kinds of things um, we want to solve by making money work for people. And the Beachhead has been initially a prepay program in the UK, now a bank account um, in the UK with a fully licensed retail bank as well. But 
to be totally honest, I think we want to go even beyond that, right? If, if you have financial concerns in other parts with other companies or anything like that, we want to bring that all in one place um, to make sure that you don't have to feel this constant anxiety around what are my finances, is, am I doing everything right, I have this savvy friend and every year they get thousand pounds savings and I don't get it because I'm not savvy. Like, these are the kinds of things we, we want to address and this is just the first well, step it's, on it. It's putting my account on autopilot autopilot sorry something if that if that's what you want potentially i think i think certainly there are often opportunities where you could where you could save so there's a company in the us now that actually you sign up and then they call up your cell phone and your broadband provider every two years to get you a cheaper deal like why not right that's something a financially savvy person should do but why can a tech company not just do it for you and what's your vision i think when it comes to our vision of the product i think we are going in, 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 in like three directions. I think one, uh, we want to do banking different, like no one is actually excited about the bank. We want to build a product and a bank people love to use. I think second <coughs> important pillar stone for us is, um, is, is cost. We want to provide banking services at the lowest possible price and undercut the market uh, wherever we are. And I think three, we want to build uh, and provide the best digital uh, user experience. So for every product, we really try to change how things uh, look like, but also how things are working. This is what is your vision. Where are you in that vision today? Well, I think we are, um, depending on the market, we are, uh, our product is like differently developed. For example, in Germany, we have a much, much more uh, complete product than in other markets. I think in Germany, there is, um, I think it's fair to say, there's no reason anymore, also from a functional perspective, to um, stay with Deutsche Bank or Sparkasse. There's just some products that are harder to internationalize. So um, in France, for example, our product is a little bit less complete than it is in, uh, in the rest. But I think in, when it comes to the claims I made, like user experience and uh, best cost, I think it's something we provide everywhere we are in. So today is a target of one platform <coughs> for every country is still not reached, but yeah. you managed to try to target the other one. And on your side, be, uh, with your vision, where are you today on your vision? You said you, you go from prepaid to bank. Um, I, I would say about, about the same place. I mean, it, it's, it's fairly similar. We are now the fastest growing bank account in the UK. So every <coughs> month of all the bank accounts that are open, most of them are, are opened in, um, in Monzo. I think we've, uh, we've done fairly well in starting to add some more subtle features on top of our capability with, with the banking license and our in-house IT, where you know maybe if tomorrow you have a direct debit coming out, it's, a, it's 100 pounds, but you only have 80 pounds, and we'll say, you, you're not going to be able to pay for this, but you have 24 hours to put the money in, or do you just want us to bounce the payment? And these kinds of things are what we always talked about, what would really make people feel in control, but you first have to get a banking license, connect to all the payment schemes, build the IT system, and get a little bit of momentum going. Um, but yeah. So you both just mentioned the uh, product side, but also a bit of the country on your side. Let's come back to this international question. Uh, since day one, when uh, I met Tom, I think it was your co-founder in 2015, you told me UK. <coughs> OK, UK now is complex, Brexit and so on, but uh, um, you, are, you have one million plus customer only in UK. Uh, you have one million plus customer globally in Europe, is that? Mm -hmm. So, you have two different strategies of development. Could you tell us more? Is it still UK only, or just UK first? And what's the next step for international view? And we we'll go the same question for Maximilian. Yeah, it's it's definitely UK first. So, so what we're beginning to see in our product is that there are genuine network effects, meaning the product becomes more valuable if more and more of your friends or maybe merchants or, or other entities use this product and are involved in it. And in those kinds of pro uh, product groups, what tends to happen is you have a winner-takes-most market. And so, we don't want to be number five in the UK, we want to have 70% market share in the UK. But also, with the way things are going with large global tech companies, I think there is space for a player with that amount of market share globally. And whether it's us or N26 or somebody else, that's definitely what we're, what we're playing for. We're currently UK only because we want to nail that in the UK. Um, I think for us, we, we look at the US as the most attractive next um, expansion point because it's five times larger market, debit card interchange is higher, meaning basically we make more revenue per customer without changing the product, and um, we already have customer service there in Las Vegas, so for us it fits together, whereas in Europe, where we also want to go and we could passport our license, there's many different cultures, many different languages, so we want to go there, but it's just harder, as, as maybe you can relate to. 
So again, UK looking at US before mainland, but <laughs> another question. So on your side, you are definitely cross Europe. Yeah, and like for us, um, it was also a vision to build the pan-European bank. Like I have to add, the vision has become uh, bigger lately, so now we want to build the first global bank. Why is it like this? We actually realized that the, uh, the needs of the customers throughout the Western world, uh, they're actually very similar. So if you think about it, um, you don't need a hundred products for a customer, but people, they want to save, they want to invest, they want to have a place to store value, they need a means to, to pay. Um, it's just, it's, it's just not so many different products you need, and it's the same problems for customers you solve basically in all the countries. And we reali realized if our product is successful in Germany, it will also be successful in, in, in France or in the UK. And if it's successful in Europe, it's probably also going to be successful in the US and in South America. And we think, and we already see this today, we can really leverage experiences like that we make in one country also to the other country. And obviously, the bigger the customer base and the more aggressive uh, we are growing, the more learnings we also take from, from the market. How many countries are you today in Europe? We're in 17 countries. And in US, you launched already? Or it's <coughs> uh, we are actually working towards the launch in the UK, which is going to happen this year. And we are going to launch in the US later, uh, no, early, early next year. So uh, basically, you managed to launch in different <coughs> countries in Europe. When we prepared, Jonas, you told us that uh, one of the main difficulties for your point of view was the front of culture mm. in Europe. I mean, uh, 27 countries is not is like 27 yeah. languages, 27 cultures for payment, for banking. I think the main thing was, I think it's actually right that the customer needs are quite similar. I mean, there's like sort of a give and take how much cash <laughs> is used in a society, but it's, you know, it's all converging in a, in a clear direction. I think it's more the, like the little payment systems or the little differences where like everybody in this country will expect you to hook up to this system, which is only used for like three transport agencies or like whatever <laughs> else it is. Or, um, I mean, uh, even, even in uh, Germany with Maestro cards and things like that, it's a bit challenging and, and fragmented. Nothing to add on the culture stuff? No, uh, basically, I, I think we, we are based in Berlin, and what's actually quite interesting to see is um, as we are providing customer service in five languages and we are providing our product in five languages, it's actually a perfect market to, uh, to hire people. It's sometimes easier to find a French copywriter compared to a German copywriter or a French customer service agent compared to a German customer service agent. Like for us, it really made a lot of sense and we didn't see the differences so much as, as an issue. You know, um, you used to, for example, more checks in, in France. You had a little bit differences like how uh, much car payment you had in the respective countries. But what we see is there is an, a convergence, like a behavior get more similar across Europe. And this is especially true for our very digital audience. Let's move to another part of, uh, of the subject, which are the business model. And I will ask you the uh, first question about the rumors. Uh, we've uh, seen the press about a big uh, funding uh, you could have mm. soon. I don't know. Can you comment on that? No. So no news information. <laughs> Let's <laughs> go and look on Twitter. You will see we speak of millions, hundreds of millions. So honestly, when I read the, the news, my first <laughs> uh, question in my mind was, OK, <coughs> last year I read uh, uh, paper you wrote from your company, being uh, Tom or you, saying that tremendous traction, but each new customer costs you like 50 pounds a year. Yeah. So I was thinking, OK, which VC is coming just to put money to spur these funds? So where are you today? I mean, the, is it still 50 pounds loss for each customer? Or yeah. I mean, it wasn't many VCs. At the time, we had the 5% weekly growth for nine months. And that got us into every, into every uh, VC um, a pitch. And then everybody's like, oh, wow, this is really expensive growth. You know, come back when it's cheaper. Thankfully, we, we got some strong partners and, and closed that round. But then for the last 12 months, what we've been busy doing is going from at the time of the fundraising, essentially minus 65 pounds per active customer per year in, in sort of net revenue to now right about zero. So this was a, a sort of combination of this migration from prepay to current account, where we could cut out a few middlemen that we were still paying. Um, it was uh, increasing customer numbers whilst holding customer service staff headcount um, constant. Uh, it was removing the ability to top up your Monzo card from other debit cards, which was really expensive for us and we thought was important in the product. But it turned out taking it away didn't really affect the metrics. And so then only recently have we started also phasing in revenue from, um, from lending. And at a high level, the way I would describe the, the business strategy or the business model strategy is first phase, 
is acquire customers using VC money. Second phase is become profitable and stable as a business by doing the things that the other banks do, which is a very, very reliable business model that has worked for hundreds of years. And the third one is the marketplace bank, where you go and connect to many, many different partners and allowing the customer to save money in that way, of which we take a little cut. So this is a third phase where you are not there. But just to come back on the second yeah. phase, you say uh, uh, begin to earn money yeah. as classical yeah. banks do. Something you don't do is uh, uh, invoicing your customer for your service. You are on a freemium uh, model, is that? The Monzo app is free. Uh, yes, there's one exception. If you take out more than 200 pounds abroad from an ATM every month, then you'll have to pay a small amount of fees to cover our costs. It's just a limit. Yeah. It's like, yeah. it's like yeah. a limit model. So you don't earn money like with money monthly fees. Yeah. So I have a question, because my understanding is that you, you, had also a, you have a free product uh, with plenty of nice stuff, but you, you decided, um, I don't know if it was from the beginning or, or a bit <coughs> later, to add some premium products. Can you tell us a bit more about this strategy? Yeah, well, in general, I think um, we started a little bit like Monzo. It's just fair to say we're a little bit further down the road when it comes to monetization. Like originally, we launched a product and it was a free bank account and we didn't have a lot of products around it. And obviously, also we started with highly negative unit economics, which is also quite okay for us. In the first year, <coughs> no one at N26 had a single monetary KPI. We were working on the trust of the customers. We were working on getting our own bank license. We were working on launching new features. And we were always totally convinced that at one point in time, if you have like hundreds of thousands or millions of customers that, um, uh, that love N26 and that do uh, their banking with N26, that we can monetize those customers at one point in time in a fair and in a, in a um, uh, transparent way. And what we then did is we were launching new features, uh, we were introducing new products, and I think getting our bank license also earlier, it just allowed us to really disrupt uh, the value chain because we could cut out uh, suppliers, we were building a lot of the, of the, of the, of the stuff that's happening in the back, like our, our core banking system, for example, that's the accounting software that's being used for banking, we built this ourselves. So I think if you look at monetization at N26, and probably that's also true for Monzo, um, you have to look at the cost base first. Uh, we acquire customers at a small fraction of the price compared to any other bank. We can maintain customers at a small fraction of the IT costs, and uh, we also have much lower overhead costs. If you think about N26, you know, or you think about other banks, to start with that, um, you have a lot of banks that have an outsourced IT company, like Deutsche Bank, HSBC, everyone has an outsourced IT company. N26 is an IT company with an outsourced bank. So the majority of the people working at N26, they're working on the best digital use experience, they're working on, uh, uh, on finding the best IT solutions, and that just provides for a totally different cost base compared to any other bank. That's for the cost base, and very interesting. But just to come back on the revenue base, um, with your premium product where you pay something yep. between uh, 9 or um, <coughs> 17 euro, I think, per month, depending on which product, uh, what is your feedback today? Do you, are the customers of Challenger Bank, startup in fintech yep. industry, willing to pay? Because we've seen, for example, in the music industry, it's difficult to make people pay. <coughs> uh, in the banking industry, did you manage to prove that if the product is really better than banks, they are willing to pay? Yeah, I think first, to, to start with, uh, with, with the most important thing, we always believed, and that was actually uh, sometimes also hard to convince people of that, uh, at the beginning when the unit economics was a negative, that the base product in banking, it can be free, sure. and it also should be free. We actually made quite good exper experiences. You know, people get used to the product, and then they're willing to pay for an even better, um, uh, for example, even better design in their cart, uh, to a much, uh, or to a more, um, a fix or Yeah, what? exactly. We're waiving certain fees and so on. And we actually were successful. What is interesting is that it's different across markets, what you also see, because they, you have so a little different people in some countries. No, not, not we're adapting our pricing, but you see that the, that the cross-selling rate is just different in one market compared to the other, because in, in some markets, the people are much more used to pay uh, for premium products, and in other uh, markets, it, it, it's less common. Thank you. So, two different vision of product, different vision, uh, different <coughs> point in your strategy, uh, as you say, different part uh, on the road you are today, um, but quite successful. So, are you just two bank genius, and by the way, German bank genius, or uh, can you tell us also about some difficulties you have in real life? I mean, is it so easy to build a million customer bank in three years, or you had some tricky part on the way? <coughs> I think it's like sometimes you get a question, you know, how, how, how is it to get like 
along with, with so much success. I can tell you, um, like reality always takes care that you're totally grounded. You know, at one point in time you have like, um, you, you have super good news and then the next time, I don't know, you read a newsletter and you have like 20 spelling mistakes in there. So um, and in some ways, I think we are still um, early stage and we have a lot of challenges. Probably the biggest challenge I had, you know, you built the startup, you found the company in your living room, like with two people, and in the beginning, you know, every cell in your business case, you have every slide on your pitch deck, and at one point in time, you realize, like in our case, that you don't build the global bank like in a group of two, but in the end, it's just about bringing in the right people, and the whole story of building a startup for me is a story of giving away responsibility. So you bring in the right people. At one point in time, it's just about recruiting, putting the right tools in the hand of the people, putting the right incentives in place, uh, and, and uh, give them the right rewards and so on. So I think this kind of world change, like from totally operational hands-on to getting more in a strategy setting and steering role, I think that was, that was for, for me like a big challenge. Same question. Uh, yeah, so um, I, I actually just on the, on the sand spotlights stage, there, I gave a, a bit of, a, a, bit of a, a presentation of that. I think it's super important that everybody at Monzo and in, in probably in everybody else's companies as well always m does work to remember all the things that went wrong because the way your brain works, you'll just be like, oh yeah, obviously everything went right because we made so many smart decisions and that's what the press does sometimes when it's going well and so on. But you read our first blog post that says, hello, here we are, in one year's time, we, l we will launch a fully licensed retail bank. In reality, we launched it three years later, right? Uh, or even the prepaid program, which some people believe was the entry vector into the market, and we somehow magically found that out. That was just a, an experiment. We didn't even know what a prepaid program was until we started, and somebody told us about that. So I, like, I try very hard to instill in every new person we hire through this monthly session this idea that you must remember all the stuff that went wrong and the process that you used to sort of overcome that rather than to get too excited about what's going well. So always remember where you come from. Um, just uh, another point on that uh, difficulties. Um, I remember a few years back in January 2016, I had a chance to have your co two co-founders <coughs> on the same stage, so Tom and Valentin. And also on that stage, uh, we had the founder of Olvi and the founder of Kant Nickel. Um, one year later, the founder of all this sold to BBVA, and last year, the founder of Comte Nickel sold 250 million to BNP Paribas. So my question is, um, do you have a figure in mind, and perhaps one day, even if you are not on sale, mm, mine can change, or you just want to stop when you will be the number one bank in the world? Well, well I I, I, N26 is for sure is, is not for sale, like not now and for many years to, to, to come. I think we have, a, we have a very big vision and we have investors that share that big vision. Like there might be more capital uh, needs in the future, but N26 will not be on the market for, uh, for the next year. Right now, we are not even thinking about it. Like right now, we are super passionate about building the product and you know, we're just scratching the surface. We're in 17 countries, there's 194 on the planet. I think the account experience is always broke. Like right now, the opportunity uh, and what we have ahead of us just seems to be way too big uh, for, for selling the company in a stage like this. Same question. Yeah. Um, Tom and I sometimes chat about that, and I think the answer is very clearly, no, there, there's no such figure. It's not really clear, clear why. It's just, I guess, not what we want to do. I spent my, um, my honeymoon the um, uh, last few weeks reading about all these huge tech companies that exist now, and all I kept thinking about was, okay, but what is the next big tech company? Like, what is gonna be different? Is it gonna be distributed work? Is it gonna be, like, social bottom line? Is it gonna be that they make their own talent? Like, and, and I want us to be that. Um, so I don't think there's any price. And to come back on that point, you were, to, until now, you are not competitors. Uh, but you will begin soon to be in UK. Do you think you will be competitors or just, like, say, together against all the incumbents? Yeah, well. I think we are we are sharing um, we are sharing a vision basically like uh, uh, Monzo like N26. We want to do better banking. We want to change the way million of people to like the bank business. Um, I think in the end, I think it's one. It's about it's about execution uh, in the respective market and the customer. Um, will decide eventually. Like if you ask me for, uh, for competition, I'm definitely not sleeping bad at night because there's another challenger that also acquires uh, customers quite successfully, but I'm really 
concerned how can we get uh, like a, a company like with 50 million or 100 million customers and that just means you have to get like 3 million customers from Deutsche Bank and uh, 5 million customers from HSBC and not, uh, um, I don't know, like uh, attack the customers from other challenges. Yeah, I definitely agree. I would even add to that. It's almost, it's almost even the case that a rising tide lifts all the challenger bank boats. The main competitor we sometimes say is apathy. People don't switch their banks. Maybe they don't trust apps. But suddenly, if there's many apps to choose from, and there's like, you know, like a, a consumer protection magazines reviewing all the challenger bank apps and stuff like that, that makes it a thing, and people can do it. So at the moment, we're just all taking customers off of the large four banks in the UK or whichever market we're in. Um, and so I think actually the competition is really, really healthy in educating people that this is now a thing that exists. Thank you very much. I see we are out of time, but I don't know if Dan gives us one minute more or if we are done. Dan, are we done or we have one minute more? <laughs> because I see out of time here, so. Okay. Another question? Do you want to do one more question? I just wanted to know if they have a question. Ooh, we haven't got Slido going, but they can shout so a question out if you want. Someone can just shout. Does anyone have a question in the audience that you want to ask these two Especially gentlemen? if it's in front, it would be easier to hear you. <laughs> yeah, hold on. There is Thank you very much, second row. <laughs> Uh-oh. Come on up. Come on, Don't come be shy. Here. Come over here. I can't jump to oh, you. Also so. a Bavarian outfit. <laughs> All right. Florian, take it away. Yeah, I think um, it's working. No. Will no. we get this we're mic we're on? Getting, yeah. No, no, it's working. Go on. Perfect. So my question is about cryptocurrencies. If that's mm. something that is on your radar, and if that's something you're seriously considering, or what the status is about this? Yeah, uh, the cryptocurrency question. Um, hmm. So, <laughs> okay, let's take one hour more, please. Uh, <laughs> the, it, I think, I think, from a consumer protection perspective, I would rather not allow our customers to or encourage them to invest in cryptocurrencies if I didn't think they were experts in that. <coughs> I think cr some cryptocurrencies have a very interesting distributed database system that might be interesting for scaling up our own ledger one day. That sort of thing, but yeah, that's all. Well, it was actually two questions. Do we have cryptocurrency on the radar? Yes, definitely. <laughs> the second one, um, I think we always think about like, a, um, like customer benefits. You know, like there's so many ideas. Uh, if you sit down with a, with a whiteboard, we would have like 50 interesting ideas to follow up to. And we really try to discipline ourselves by what really provides the most customer benefit. And if we ask our customers, like, do you want to have a saving functionality or do you want to have like, um, like a new card tier, then I just know that people are much, much more interested in that than in cryptocurrency. So it's not yet on our product roadmap to do anything in that space. Thank you so much, Guy. And you can applaud them, I think. Yeah. Excellent. Let's give them a hand. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.